Hi guys, welcome to Academy. So we'll be talking about different topics in dentistry that will prepare you for the exam in GAR DLE exams, that is your Gulf related uh, exams. So today we'll be talking about two important topics, that is ethics and sterilization. So you will have a couple of questions that come on it, probably one to three questions. So accordingly, once you finish today's uh, discussion, you'll get an idea how to answer these exam uh, answer these questions. So the first topic is ethics. Now ADA has given five principles for ethics in dentistry. And uh, here we'll be discussing, for example, first is patient autonomy. That means the patient has, the dentist has the duty to respect the patient and right to decide what can be done to the patient's body, okay? Next is non-maleficence. Non-maleficence means do not do harm. The word mal means bad, that is a Portuguese term. So non-maleficence means do not do any harm with the patient, where the patient has the right that the dentist doesn't do any harm to him. That is the dentist has to refrain from any harmful procedures on the patient. Next is beneficence, that is doing good for the patient. The dentist has a duty to promote the patient's welfare. You have to consider the pros and cons when you are informing the patient regarding a certain treatment and you would only proceed with something that is beneficial for the patient. Next is justice. The dentist has a duty to treat patients fairly. That means all the patients will be treated equally. And veracity, that is truthfulness. It's the duty of the dentist to communicate truthfully to the patient the pros and cons of your procedure. Now, ADA has given five principles. In Soben Peter, they have added another one that is confidentiality. Confidentiality refers to the types of records that will be there with the dentist has to be remained confident, confidential. That means the patient has to be kept uh, the records with himself and cannot discuss with any other doctor. So now we'll see the principles one by one. First, we'll go on to autonomy. Autonomy refers to self-governance, that is the respect for the person. That is your patient that comes into your clinic. You have to have the utmost respect for the patient and treat him correctly, give him the right uh, advice and decide the pros and cons of the treatment. So every human being of an adult and sound mind has the right to determine what shall be done to his own body. That means when the patient is seeking your treatment, he has to be able to choose his treatment without any pressure and to accept or refuse the treatment. The patient has the right to refuse the treatment even while the treatment is going on. So you have to allow your patients to have this ethical right of autonomy. Informed consent, okay, is the basis and most of the questions come on this. So informed consent is an essential component of a patient's right to autonomy. Now, what are the different age groups that a patient can give consent? Especially adults more than 18 years of age are considered as competent and can give consent. Whereas children, they have different age groups. Children from below the age of seven, they have no role in decision making. Okay. Any child that is below the age of seven cannot decide the trial of treatment, has no mental capacity to decide what the will be the pros and cons of a treatment. So all the decisions will be made only by the parents or a legal guardian. A legal guardian can be a grandparent or any relative that the child is staying with. Now, children from the age of seven to puberty. They said to have developed some amount of intellectual capacity to understand and participate in the discussion about the treatment. So their views should be listened to and considered. But the parents in this case will also make the final decision. So children between the age of seven to puberty, they can assent to the treatment, that is give agreement, but it is not legally binding. So you can give agreement, but only the parent can consent the final treatment decision. Children above the age of puberty, that is around 12, okay, but the under the age of 18, they are considered virtually adults and can make the decision about their treatment unless they're proven incompetent. So parents or guardians should assent to their decision before treatment is carried out. That means the patient, any patient that is between the age of 12 to 18 can assent or agree, uh, can give their consent for the treatment but the parents have also have to agree to the same treatment plan. Now let's just take an example. For example, you have three different types of consents, okay? Implied consent, express consent, and informed consent. Now implied consent is the consent which is assumed through actions or circumstance. 
which means without the need for explicit verbal or written agreement. Implied consent refers to any patient who is coming to your OPD, sitting on your chair. That is, they are implying that they are ready for any treatment that you tell them. This is only unchecking, that is clinical examination. Other type of income implied consent will be any patient that is having a life-threatening situation. For example, anyone, any child that is having, uh, for example, uh, uh, swelling that is obstructing their airway, patient not able to breathe. Those are life-threatening situations. So there also there'll be implied consent to help the patient that the, uh, the legal guardian or the patient itself is implying that I can go ahead with the treatment that you decide. This is implied treatment. Here, for example, in routine, non-invasive procedures, or as I said, emergency procedures. For example, a patient sitting in the dentist chair, opening in the mouth, implies for consent for examination only. No invasive procedures will be taking place. You cannot do any uh, restorations or scaling unless the patient has uh, uh, unless the patient has given you an informed consent. Now, when we talk about express consent, express consent refers to explicit consent, which is either given in writing or given verbally. Here, the difference between expressed and implied is that expressed, it is an urgent nature, similar to implied, but it is not life-threatening. Okay, Any invasive treatments or interventions or risk need to be explained to the patient. A verbal or written agreement for an emergency root canal. Patient is in pain. It's an urgency, but it's not life-threatening. Or a patient has met with an accident. He has fractured his tooth or he has a tooth has to be implanted back again. So those are urgent treatments, but not life-threatening. Their express consent can be taken. And lastly, when we talk about informed consent, informed consent refers to any form of express consent where the patient or the legal guardian agrees to treatment after being informed of the whole procedure. So most of the dental treatment procedures that we undertake are planned. So they come under informed consent. So you have to take it under writing from the patient that the treatment has been explained, the risks and complications have been explained, the different modalities of treatment have been explained. That comes under informed consent, where it is an elective or planned treatment. Okay, your legal guardian will give consent. For example, if it is a child, for a child's dental extraction, a legal guardian has to give informed consent after understanding all the aspects of the procedure or even in the case of orthodontic treatment because it is a planned procedure. Okay, that's the difference. Now, let's just take an example. A six-year-old child is brought to the dental clinic by his grandfather and the child is experiencing severe pain and is diagnosed with deep dental caries requiring an emergency root canal treatment. So, in this case, a six-year-old child has been brought, so it's not competent, cannot give consent. Okay, the child is experiencing severe pain and is diagnosed with deep dental caries requiring an emergency root canal treatment. That means it is urgent, but it is not life-threatening. What type of consent should the dentist obtain before proceeding the treatment? Will it be implied consent, express consent, informed consent, or no consent is required? Let's just have a look at the examples. Okay. So in different scenarios, for example, if you have an uh, implied consent. Now, when you give an implied consent, in case it is a life-threatening emergency, assuming the consent is to save the life or to prevent any serious harm. You are a child with dental abscess causing airway obstruction or a systemic infection risk. Okay, you give an implied consent. Express consent is given in case of urgent but non-life-threatening Explicit agreement needs to be proceeded. That means you have to explain the procedures to the patient. A child with severe pain during due to caries requiring an emergency root canal treatment. And lastly, your informed consent, non-emergency planned treatments. So detailed explanation and understanding is required by the patient. You have to explain the pros and cons. For example, a patient is in moderate discomfort needing a filling which can be scheduled at a later date. So this will be informed, any pre-planned procedure. So in this situation, a six-year-old child brought to the dental clinic, patient experiencing severe pain, that means it is urgent, diagnosed with deep dental caries requiring emergency root canal treatment. So it's not life-threatening, it is urgent, but not life-threatening. In this case, you will consider it to be an expressed consent. Okay. 